Uh, well, I'm going to start by actually asking. Um, we talked to Elaine yesterday, and oh, cool. she was talking about how long the movie took to mm. come. She started it about 15 years ago in terms of putting it together. Oh, it's 20 now. Yeah. <laughs> and so, how were you two first yeah. involved in the film? And how did that, that kind of first connection happen? With Do you want to go first? So, she got involved first? Uh, yeah, so I met Elaine when I was 19. I'm now 28. So, like, it's been a long process. Um, we met on a, a job, it was a random job, as a photo shoot, and um, Elaine came up to me, and uh, I had quite long hair at the time, and she was like, you look like John Clark. And I was just like, who's John Clark? And uh, she explained that she'd been writing this script, and it's kind of half based on a few people that she'd, like, grown up with, and the uh, Northern Soul scene, and I didn't know what that was. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a funny one. She told me about the script, and then she said, I'll, I'll contact you. And a year went by, I heard nothing, and I kind of forgot. And then uh, she got in contact and sent me the script, and um, I got to read it, and I was, like, fascinated by this whole thing. So, yeah, it was quite a, a long, mm. long process. But uh, I met Elaine uh, when I was about 18, 19 <clears throat> as well, actually. Um, I met her doing uh, a modelling shoot. Like, I was uh, on a fashion shoot with her. <clears throat> and like, I'd done a couple in my time, like a few, not much, but I'd done a few and I'd always not really enjoyed modelling, it's not really my thing. Uh, but when I met Elaine and we did this, she, she was just so different with the way that she handled it. She was, you know, like, all about forgetting vanity and not posing and being completely not self-conscious about anything, you know, and, and, and that for me was like a really sort of enlightening change to see from a director, mm -hmm. especially for something to do with fashion. So I was sort of quite desperate to keep Working with that, you know, I, I didn't really, I didn't really care about what the project was, but I just thought, you know, whatever I could do to stay working with those guys, they're so much fun that I'd love to work with them again. And then she uh, told me that they were doing dance clubs, uh, and she'd been writing a film. And if I wanted to go along and learn to dance, then maybe I could get a role in the film. And so then I ended up doing that for about what was six months, and then that led on to having like a personal trainer, which then led on to getting acting lessons from her, and then doing workshops with him and the other guys, and then. Yeah, eventually, eventually, just about a month before we started filming, she said, go on then, you can have a lead role. <laughs> I was, okay, cool, Thank you. wicked. Yeah. So am I right, have both of you, you hadn't acted before, I don't think, had you? And you'd done a couple of smaller things? But yeah, yeah. So what was it kind of getting like to be on your first film set and kind of a first feature film like that for both of you? Mind-blowing. Completely mind blowing for me. I was just like, wow. It's pretty nerve wracking that first day. Do you remember just sort of. This is just like silent yeah. sunset and everyone's just like, oh, it's the first take of the first day. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was really nerve wracking. But then at the same time, you know, we'd spent so much time with Elaine and with the team and with the other dancers and learning to dance and like just living and breathing the actual thing and meeting DJs and meeting people from the scene and going to actual all-nighters and kind of living it a little bit that by the time we were on set it was just like yeah it's about time let's do this let's make it let's make it <laughs> yeah we were definitely ready for it I mean uh, yeah the process that we went through with all the dance lessons and things like that and I lost two stone for the part which I didn't initially mean to do but I just thought yeah I did that, as well. um, just kind of the certain look that we both needed to get. We needed to look like we'd been going to all nighters and taking loads of drugs and you yeah. know not eating much. So there was a lot of preparation. But as Josh said, it's you know we I've never really felt as prepared for anything. Yeah, I had to go on holiday the week before we started filming, and I, I was I was in this really hot country with a really big umbrella the whole time, just like trying to stay pale. <laughs> <laughs> like all my friends are like lying on the beach getting tans, and I'm just like standing there like. I can't. I've got to because we, we filmed the first the, the dance scenes a month before the rest okay. of the film. We had two days filming for dance scenes, uh, and so yeah, it would have looked a little bit strange if. Awesome. Yeah, I'm like really brown <laughs> for like all of the dancing, and then the rest of the film really pale. You know, that could have been a bit weird. Can you talk actually a bit about the dancing? Because the dancing is phenomenal in it. What was the so you you had dance lessons as a group kind of <clears throat> leading up to it? What yeah. Was, what was that kind of like? It was. Um, I mean, it was. It started off with I, I started lessons with a person called Kev Darge, who's he's he's really well known in the um, scene. He's a DJ and a phenomenal dancer, and uh, Josh came along as well. And we we were doing like kind of once a week, and it slowly like built up. And then um, as more people came into the project, we had group lessons. So we had um, and there, there there would be ones up north, and there'd be ones in London as well. And it was really nice though. It was like a real kind of. Uh, 
family environment. It was really everyone. It wasn't so much a competition. It was just helping each other and um, improving. You'd watch someone do a move, and you go, over, "Oh, well, how'd you do that?" And then they'd show you. It was kind yeah. of. It was a really nice collaborative um, way of doing it, really. Yeah. I was pretty terrified when I first went down. I mean, that's not the sort of thing I go and do. But again, it was one of those things I kind of braved for the sakes of, you know, like this sort of want to be involved with, with that team and just sort of the, knowing that they're going to have a laugh and it's going to be fun. But getting there and uh, deciding, yeah, I'll go to the dance class and then I go and meet these guys and see what they're doing. And then getting there and they're all doing backflips and stuff. And I'm like, well, <laughs> this is pretty intimidating. Uh, I feel really socially phobic. <laughs> but then just kept doing it. And they were also inviting and so sort of, you know, you'd go and see Franny at the beginning and then uh, there'd, there'd be sort of levels that as, as you go through, you go to different people. And then Paul Sado used to run the dance like the dance clubs for everyone, and he'd hype everyone up, and Elena would teach everybody the attitude. And after we'd been doing that, like, well, after I'd been doing that about six months, then I went to go and see Keb Dodge once a week on top of the monthly dance classes. Okay. And then, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of level. Um, I was doing that for about two years, yeah. It's a lot of dancing. It's a lot of dancing. <laughs> you need a lot of dancing to learn to dance properly like yes, that from scratch. It's, I'm so glad we had that time. Mm. I um, wouldn't have got the part if we didn't have that time. <laughs> you know, in terms of, in terms of that, so yeah. So you mentioned that you hadn't really known about the Northern Soul scene before. Had you ever heard of kind of no, that movement? Never what heard of it. What kind of surprised you about it when you were getting into it and researching and, and kind of preparing? Um, how much it grows on you. Yeah, because, I mean, it was so... It's, it's, it's a really, really weird feeling to be given three albums worth of music that you'd never heard before. And whether it's good or not, being expected to fall in love with it, you know, and needing to fall in love with it for the sakes of a film, but it's like brand new. It's like you listen to it and you're like, everyone's saying that I'm going to love it and, uh, you know, they like it and everyone's so passionate about it. Am I going to like it? And then you listen and you go, I think I like it. I don't know. But then the more you listen, they're just, they're brilliant records, you know, there's a lot of, it's really, really inspiring after a lot of time, you know, I sort of. So I've ended up like writing songs around it and sort of covering a lot of Northern Soul tunes with my with some of my bands. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. What about you? When you were kind of yeah, I, it's it's one of those things that I uh, at the time I asked my dad like thinking oh he's the right sort of age he'll know a bit about it but he's from the south and. Um, he pretended he knew about it. <laughs> I see found out once I'd done the you know a bit of work on it, and I realised he didn't really know anything. But um, yeah, and it's it's Northern Soul, and that that music is just such an iconic thing, and it feels weird now to think that I wasn't aware of it beforehand. I mean, it's a whole world that we were just opened up to. Um, it's kind of nice though for me because with my character, that was kind of how it works in the film. Like he he's completely unaware of it, and then um, mm. Josh's character, you know invites him into this world and it's kind of how I felt when I first met Elaine she was like well this is Northern Soul and I was like oh right okay mm -hmm. um, and in terms of uh, the sorry I'm just going completely blank um, I was going to ask in terms of the music itself is there anything any tracks that really stuck with you after you made the movie yeah definitely so for me uh, definitely Lou Pride I'm coming home in the morning and Frankie Valley uh, and the Four Seasons, The Night. Which because they're, they're the, the two songs yeah. that I, I've covered with, with my bands, actually. Okay. Yeah. Lou Pride only in a live sense, with like this band with loads of horns and stuff. And it's like more of a hip-hop group that do it, but then uh, Frankie Valley, it was with mine, yeah. Yeah, those two particularly, I think. What about for you? Um, I mean, there's loads. Of, on the soundtrack, it's weird because there's a lot of songs that they, they couldn't clear, they couldn't use that originally we were dancing to. So there's a few that actually didn't make it into the film that I really like. One of the, my f absolute favourite, though, is Tawanda Barnes, um, You Don't Mean It, which is, I, I don't know why. It's, a very, it's slightly different. I mean, the beginning of the song is really good for, it's like stomping. It's got a good beat to it. That's my favourite mm. for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean the soundtrack's pretty amazing. There's, I think there's over. They're all bangers. There's like 50 tracks. That's on the, the thing. They're all very different, yeah. but they're all really individual sounds and really, really good songs. Mm. There's a couple that don't quite tickle you in the right way, but the, mostly it's, you know. <laughs> Considering how many songs there are, there, yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah. tons of it. Tons yeah. of it. There are a few songs now that, like, if I hear them. Um, they kind of give me a little shiver down the spine, but not in a good way because they'll be the ones where I was at Kebs, like sweating buckets, like mm -hmm. trying to learn some bleeding, that bleeding I can do. through the heels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was always, you'd always just like repeat the same song, and yeah. in the end you'd be like, oh. Um, 
Yeah, yeah what's, what's, good memories. what's surprising with Northern Soul as well is that each of the, because you've got like the Chicago, the Detroit, and the different sort of areas in Philadelphia, and they've, they've all got different sounds, but you know, generally you don't find that there's a band that do Northern Soul. You, right. you don't. They do one Northern Soul track, and it's maybe a collective of people that have come together to make it, you know, and they're usually one offs, uh, but they, they have this similar sound of, to, to all the areas, you know, and it's, it, that's something I find really interesting about them is that so, so many different groups of people could get together and make something, you know, which fits into a category, which is, it, it seems really random, but it all sounds as though it fits together, but no one makes an album of it, you know, it's kind of really interesting. What is it, do you think, about the music from Detroit and, and that era that spoke to the kids in the North at that time? I mean, Detroit specifically? Or no, but like the, the Northern Soul, the, the music, the American Soul music, basically. Mm -hmm. The kids in Lancashire, et cetera, kind of blend onto. How do, what was it about that that they kind of, that spoke to them? I think that's what makes it fascinating, though, that it is kind of this weird thing. You kind of go, where and how did that happen? And how did those people in the north of England come across this music? And then how did it become so big? Well, I think it's because also they, they used to go into <clears throat> record shops in the States and, you know, people started finding unknown records that that people had just never heard of before because they were throwaways, you know, and, you, you know, people people didn't have it. And then all of a sudden, you know, they put a cover-up sticker over the record and they go play it in a, in, in a, in a, a venue and everyone starts dancing and they're like, what is that song? And it gave them power, you know, and, and, and it gave them the power of being the guy that had that record and no one else knew what it was. You know, so in a sense, they, that kind of made them almost godlike on the scene, you know, because where did they get it? And, and, and the lengths that they would have to go to to find those records and have something that no one else had was actually quite far. You know, they'd have to get out to the States and go and route through places like this until they found something completely unknown. Well, do you think it kind of gave them a sense of purpose? Because where they were coming from, I mean, you see in the scenes with your character in school, with the teachers, where it's kind of, it's you'll never amount to anything, like, mm. just we'll get through this and you'll do what you're supposed to do because that's what everybody's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then this is such a different thing. Is it that kind of, it gives them something else to to kind of aspire to in a different... I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely... Uh, the people that are into Northern Soul, you know, they live for Northern Soul. Northern Soul is their passion and, and it's what makes the whole thing so special, really. Yeah, there's definitely a level of escapism as well yeah. from... From, you know, in, in, in the sort of north of England, there's not a great deal going on, or at least there wasn't back then, certainly, I don't know, I've spent a fair bit of time in Bolton and Bury and, you know, those areas, Wigan, and it's, it can be quite dull. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's quite a grey area of the world, in a sense, but it's also got a lot of life to it and a lot of great people, you know, but the, there's no shiny places to go and have fun, there's no roller coasters <laughs> and stuff, you know. But I, I think, yeah, music was something that people could cling on to and, and believe in, like a, like a Bible, you know? <laughs> it's you know, faith, religion, keep, yeah. keep the faith, you know? It's, mm. it's, it's all there for a reason, yeah. Well, and because you spent so long and committed so much time to the movie, what does it feel like? I know that it got released in the UK in November, I think, but now that you're bringing it to international audiences, what's that kind of like being able to finally share it with people? <sighs> it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's great. It's, yeah, it's a real honor. It's, it feels... I don't, you know, we, we always knew that the film was special, but I don't, I don't know if we ever believed it would translate other than anywhere in England. I mean, it was, it obviously had an audience there, but to have it here at Toronto Film Festival is kind of, we were saying in a previous interview that, you know, this started in Elaine's kitchen for us, you know, we were there kind of going through the script going, oh yeah, this is great, this would be amazing to be able to do this. And now we're sitting at Toronto Film Festival and we've had the pleasure of being able to have it you know, seen by so many people, it's, it's yeah. kind of crazy, I, I, I really. Couldn't, I couldn't believe it that it, it came out in a cinema in the UK, you know, I mm. could not believe it. I couldn't believe that, that I'd managed to be a part of such a big production in my life at all. That, you know, that was quite enough. But then, you know, it, it, it definitely deserves to be shared and it's great. I'm so happy for <clears throat> Elaine that her story gets to be sort of put further and, and, and people can hear it and see it and appreciate it and all of this is happening because she really deserves it. She and have you gotten a chance it. to actually sit in an audience and watch it? Yeah. With, with people? Seven, what, what, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Has anything surprised you kind of about people, the way they're connecting to the film? Or? I've, not, I've not seen the reaction in the States yet, mm -hmm. but when it was out in the UK, I went to a few of the screenings and it 
People, people stood up and clapped at the end, and I've never seen that in a cinema. Like, I mean, maybe, maybe a premiere of something, yeah. you know, but not just in a public cinema. Like, I was mm. really, really shocked. <laughs> like, wow, uh, that's surprising. You know, I was hiding at the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the film, the film did so much better than I mean, because it had a very limited release, but mm -hmm. um, because of that. Every screen was like packed, and as you say, every time I went to see it, it was you know it was a full house pretty much, and mm. and yeah, people got up every every screen I went to, people up and clapped, and oh, wow. whether or not we, you know, hiding at the back as he says, or you know, with your family, and yeah, it was a very proud moment, and the fact that Elaine's managed to get the film to where it is now is just it's beyond all my expectations. Um, it's just, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it.